It's Miss Steph from the Whitman Public Library, and today I'm taping a special story time from home. At story time, we always start with our mystery box. And today I have a really big mystery box. So together, let's say, knock, 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 what's behind the box? Ready? Knock, 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 what's behind the box? Let's slide it out of the way and see. This is my dog, Rowan. Today I want to share a story with you that reminds me of Rowan. This is called Here George by Sandra Boynton and we're sharing this today with permission from Simon & Schuster. This is George. He likes to sit. Here George, says a lady's voice. George does not move. Here George, says a man's voice. George does not move. Come on boy says a child's voice. George does not move. That's okay, says the lady's voice. George must be tired. We'll go for a ride without him. So the man and the lady and the child drive away. There's George watching them go. George is feeling a little glum. He lies down, closes his eyes, Outside, some wild music begins to play. George opens his eyes. He likes music. Now George is sitting. Now George is standing. Now George is dancing and dancing and dancing. Whew, until he can dance no longer. George hears the car door slam. Slam, slam, slam. He sits up and wags his tail. We're home, George, says the lady's voice. George does not move, except his happy tail. We're home, George, says the man's voice. George does not move, except his happy tail. Come here, you sweet little puppy dog, says the child's voice. George does not move, except his happy tail. Yes, this is George. He likes to sit, he likes to sleep, he loves his family, and he is wild about dancing, which no one knows but you. Do you think Rowan dances wildly when I'm not at home? Maybe. Thanks for listening to Storytime today. In this program, we're also talking to Marcy Walsh O'Connor, the director of the Whitman Public Library, to find out what's been going on at the library since things have closed down. I mean, you figure, some people are definitely gonna figure, there's no people in the library, what are the librarians gonna do? Marcy, what do the librarians do when there are no people in the library? All right, so on March 14th was the last day we were open to the public. And after that day, we came into the library in groups of two and three. So the building has been staffed Monday through Friday since the middle of March. Um, staff has been working on our Facebook presence. I have um, Mary, Barbara, and Stephanie have been working really arduously for to promote what the library's been doing. Barbara's doing the great Corona Diaries album on Facebook on the Whitman Public Library Facebook page. It is phenomenal. It's just a like a photographic journal of what's been going on in everyone's life. Barbara is a very good writer. I've always enjoyed reading her pieces that show up in the newspaper. Okay, right. and, and she's continuing to write her column. She just um, submitted one um, on Monday, so she's been working on her columns every, she does every other week for those. It's, you know, I think it's helpful to reach the people, especially the column, the people that aren't on Facebook, to let them know the comings and goings of the library. Um, for, like, collection process, um, Nick and myself have been shifting the nonfiction collection and making some more space. Some of the sections were getting a little tight in there. Stephanie was doing some weeding and relabeling projects. These are things that when we're open, we do continue to do, but it takes so much longer when we get interrupted by the patrons. So uh, shifting an entire non adult nonfiction collection has taken us weeks instead of what usually takes us months to do. Well, I know Nick has been doing some other things. He did some great research for me yeah. for a radio program that uh, Marie Layla and I did 
on WATD about contrasting the coronavirus pandemic to the influenza pandemic of 1918. And he really did a great job getting through to the Dyer Library. I couldn't reach anybody over there. And, <laughs> And, and had them send me through all kinds of great stuff from, from the local papers that were being published at that time. And right. We did a, had a great, I had a great time working on the research when he got me the, the stuff. It was, it was just wonderful. And I want to, want to thank him again for, for doing all that for me. Yeah. And so thankfully, right after he sent everything to you, uh, Justin Evans, one of the select people, asked almost the same exact question. So he was able just to forward everything he had forwarded to you. But it was very interesting. I ended up forwarding it to a couple of friends because they were like, we've, we've gone through this before as a society. Why are we reinventing the wheel? Like, what did they do that was right? And what did they do that was wrong? And let's, let's work on that. Uh, and we don't really know what actually worked and didn't work because some of the um, material is has got gaps in it. Although right. you know that they did they did try and reopen things a little too early and had to shut things down again fairly quickly. Right. So well, anyhow, okay. Now that we've now that we've given Nick all kinds of plaudits here, you can continue on with uh, explaining what what you were what you've been doing while you've been closed. Um, and we also took some time to we have a back room that is storage for. Um, craft supplies, cleaning supplies, our book sale when we have it twice a year. And so Sharon did a phenomenal job of organizing that. At, at times the fire department has had to come in and say, you need clear paths and there weren't clear paths. So now it's very clean, organized, everything's labeled. So all the craft stuff is organized by age and by season. It looks phenomenal, the work she did on that. So it's, you know, we've, taken some really good times to organize the library. We've done some heavy duty cleaning with uh, the custodians at the town hall and just some level of things that needed to get done that we were thankful to have the time to do them and not disrupt patrons. So, um, and then starting the last week in May, we were given the go ahead by the Board of Health, the state and the town administration and the trustees to start um, doing what we call a curbside pickup and we opened our book drop. So you can now return your items that you've had checked out since the beginning of March and we do urge people to get those in. Um, materials are due the end of June, so you have some time. And we're doing curbside pickup so you can call, email the library and um, place holds on the online catalog and we'll set them aside for you so that you can pick them up. Um, you call the library and ask, you know, set a time with the librarians to pick them up. Yeah, and we gotta tell people too, don't try to uh, sanitize your items before you bring them back to the library. Cause no. somebody who's gonna use hydrogen peroxide, alcohol, bleach solution, or anything like that is going to really damage the materials that they've got. Right, so the the items that are getting returned to the library are now being set aside in the community realm for 10 days. So every day staff is opening the book drop with gloves and masks and taking the items out carefully, putting them on a table and dating them for when they can be checked in. I, so when you return something, it's not immediately gonna come off your account, but when we do check it in, everything, all the fines are being waived. So for the, you know, for a while now, we're not gonna be collecting fines. So don't worry about that. In 10 days um, by the CDC, the Board of Health and the town administration definitely is gonna get rid of anything on any surface. So there will be no more virus on it. Okay, now that takes, takes care of books and some electronics. Are there any other things that are out there that are not uh, typical um, library items that people might wanna also remember you don't sanitize this? Yeah, so we have cake pans. We also have hot spots. Probably be a bad idea to dip that in bleach. We have playaways, which are tablets for the kids to use that have games on them. Again, any of that can be returned in the book drop. 
Um, if it's something oversized that doesn't fit in the book drop, call us. We're there 9 to 4.30, Monday through Friday, um, and we will um, get that from you. Yeah. Now, there are also some other things that I discovered by looking at your website that um, there's a little blurb there that says, with your library card, you can access hundreds of free online resources 24-7. And can you tell us, like, what some of those resources are that you can in, in, um, access online? Sure. So we have three major ones that we use. It's Hoopla, Overdrive slash Libby, and RB Digital. So Hoopla allows you with your library card to borrow audiobooks, music albums, regular electronic books, and movies and television shows. And the amazing thing about Hoopla is you get five checkouts a week, a month. Um, we upped that from four before um, this all happened. They also have a separate library of things that you don't have doesn't go against your checkouts and there's no waiting so if it's on that website you are able to check it out um watch films and movies for three days everything else goes out for three weeks and then if you don't finish it you just check it out again because there's no there's no waiting so no one else is waiting for you it's really what we call in library land uh, patron driven acquisition and so we only pay for what people check out so i don't like other things i have to pay for i have to pay for even if no one looks at it this is i just pay every month a fee for how many things are looked at so it's it's amazing I really encourage people to use that. So that's uh, www.hoopladigital.com. You sign in with your library card and your PIN. When your PIN is OCLN, unless you've changed it, and then you can borrow five things a month. And if I sometimes forget about it, and at the end of the month, I'll check out five things, and then come July 1st, I can check out five new things, and I can still have those five things at the end of the month that I checked out. So, so could, you, could you just spell that? Is that Coopla with a C or Hoopla with an, H, with, with an H? With an H. H-O-O-P-L-A. Right. And um, do they, like you folks do at the library, when with your electronic books, have them in PDF format as well as Nook and, and uh, Amazon? So that you would use on a, a device like a Fire tablet or a smartphone um, your computer. Um, it's you're reading it in the what we call in the app. So right. there's no downloading. You can download things to your device so that then you're not using any data. So when you're home, you can put everything on the device and you're reading it in the in the application. So you don't have to have a Nook or a, or a, or a Fire device to actually read the books. Nope, you can read them right on your phone if you so choose. That's wonderful. And the movies, is they have a kind of like a, a termination date on, on those things? So those are three days you can check yeah. them out for. So if you try and keep them longer than three days, they kind of don't work anymore or, or you're not. So they go off your device and then you, you would have to borrow it again if you didn't finish it in that three days. Okay. What, what else did we have from, uh, there was a couple of other um, sites. So, oh, Overdrive and Libby, it's they're the same thing. They're just named two different apps. Um, Overdrive works on some devices and Libby works on some other devices. And at some point, Libby will be the gold standard and Overdrive will disappear. But right now, both of them work. And again, some of them work on some devices and some work on the other devices. And that is ebooks audi and audiobooks. And those are things that the librarian decides to put in the collection. And so that's typical of like how a library works. We buy the electronic materials and then the patrons borrow them. The good thing about Overdrive and Libby in, in Massachusetts is we share as a network through OCLN, but you can also look, borrow things from other networks, um, BPL, Sales, CLAM, CW Mars. And so you can look at all of those networks. If we don't have something, you can look at theirs. You can also make recommendations. So we look at those when we borrow things. And then I can also, when I buy things for the library, 
I look and see how many holds are on things and I can buy more copies. Um, it's, it is, it's very interesting to look at the cost for buying individual titles is much more than buying a print title, but we spent a lot of money this spring into summer on buying e-materials, knowing full well that that's only the, the only thing until we opened curbside that the patrons would have access to. Yeah. And so Stephanie, when she does summer reading for the kids every year um, for like Whitman Hanson Regional, um, she does buy things electronically and in print just to cover people that prefer that um, form of reading. Yeah. Now you said you said Libby is going to become the gold standard. What is the difference between um, Libby and? It's just the way the app is laid out. Overdrive is the parent company, and Overdrive has existed, I want to say, since the early two thousands, maybe the late nineteen nineties. Um, and then, so they've changed the name of the app. So there's two different apps. There's Overdrive and Livy, but the titles are the same on it. It looks a little different. So I try and get people when um, I show them which one I try to tell them to use Libby because eventually Overdrive is going to go away. But they've been telling this that for a couple of years now. It's kind of like upgrading uh, an app on your computer sometimes because yes. every now and then you get they make such a big change. Mm -hmm. And the way it works that you kind of wonder, you know, what they had in mind. Um, right. Yeah, because when, when, when most software companies don't change the name of an app that you're using if they're just upgrading it, but this is, must be much more than just a, an incremental upgrade to have them change the name entirely like that. Right, and the layout is a lot different. And I like, f as a patron, I use Overdrive, and but I always encourage people to start using Libby, and it is much easier to use the Libby platform than the Overdrive platform. But <laughs> because I'm used to using the Overdrive platform, I always have to think, oh, how do we do this again? It's kind of like, kind of like going from. Um... Photoshop to GIMP and back again, I suppose, because, yes. but then again, that's two completely different um, people that, that put those two right. things out. Right, probably more like Photoshop and Lightroom. Yeah, so now that, now that we've taken care of how, uh, about the, the um, resources people have while you're closed, mm -hmm. how are you getting ready to open up again? So we have, I've had lots of meetings with the state, with the Board of Health, with the town administrator, the trustees, staff, trying to figure out how to open again. We just got word from the state that phase two libraries can open to in person. However, it's only coming to the CERC desk. Like you can't browse the collection. You can't use the computers. So most libraries are saying, well, what is the benefit of that versus just continuing to go curbside where there's a lot of extra cleaning involved while letting patrons in the building. So most libraries have decided to just continue to do curbside until the state says that we can have patrons use the computer, maybe browsing the collection, and really getting a handle on like 25% capacity, or is that 10 people? Is that 25? Is that 50? What does that really look like? Stephanie's been working really hard on her summer reading program, and she usually it's all paper. So this year she has designed a, an online component for people, but she's still issuing the paper reward system. Um, we've done away with a toy chest so kids aren't digging through that and you'll just get like a rainbow crayon for week one and bubbles for week two, that sort of thing. Um, it's really rethinking everything that we used to do and trying to make it safe for staff and the community. Um, I had a meeting with the Board of Health the end of May and she was like, have you thought about when we do open? how are you gonna let people browse? And I hadn't even thought of that and letting people browse, are you gonna follow them behind them with Lysol wipes and if they touch something and put it back? Um, I've done, I've read a lot. We've watched a lot of webinars as a staff about 
like surface versus person. And for the most part, the way this disease is contracted is through person to person. It's not someone touching something and then someone else touching it. But we do want to be as safe as possible. Um, we are building plexiglass for the circ desk and the children's room desk. So we won't be open to the public until at least those are in place. There is going to be like, I have to take temperatures for the staff, like, like town halls investigating whether when they open to have people come in, whether they're going to take their temperatures, everyone's going to be required face mask for, I see for a long time. And I think ideally I'd like to do curbside and book drop for a while so that we don't have to like open to the public and then like a second wave happen and then have to go back to being closed completely. Like if we can just continue curbside and let most of the community have the access that they need. I, I do feel bad that the computers are sitting there and I know, I know this community needs their computers but until the state and the board of health tells me, okay, you can let people come in and use the computers and then I clean them after someone leaves and then another person comes down and they can sit. I just, I have to listen to everyone that's saying this is safe and this is not safe. I can, I can see that that could be a real problem in the children's room because the children are, are so social and, and right. tend to, tend to uh, bunch together frequently. Right. And we've like, a, libraries around us have talked about there's most libraries have an unattended children policy of like if you're under nine you can't come in without a parent and they've talked about not letting like you have to be over 16 because kids just don't know how to social distance yeah like i don't i don't like it breaks my heart one of our best programs is our baby story time for zero to three mondays at 10 30 but how do you tell a two-year-old to stay in this little square and not come up and touch Stephanie's book? Like, that's just, that's just not going to work for a long time. Well, I, I, I can see that that may be something that we can help here. Rather than doing library story time at the library, do it here in the studio. Right. And, and Stephanie... Stephanie did a story time and posted it on YouTube and we posted it on the Facebook page. And once we get more situated, I bet she'll do some of those in the summer. She's also created some craft projects for take home during the summer. Cause we usually have like people come in and do crafts at the library. And that's just, again, we like if we socially distance in the community room, maybe we'll get, we can get 10 kids in, but that's not fair to the other 30 that usually sign up for those. Because uh, that story that she did was it here, George? Or yeah. Because I, I I managed to get a copy of that and scanned it, and I will be putting that hopefully with this program that we're doing right now mm -hmm. to just kind of give us a kind of a double barrel thing for kids and adults on this right. program. And um, that's something I would love to be able to do. You know, if if Stephanie thinks it's it's a, an idea to do story time as a remote from. Uh, mm -hmm. you know remote via our channel right they won't have be able to do the crafts but she can probably show them a little bit about how to do something like that to the parents right okay now um we're talking about reopening and you said there's a lot of things you have to do to prepare do you have any idea what might be coming down the pike from the state for regulations as far as um Anything, anything else going on in the library? Uh, will you be able to do things like have the author talks and lectures, uh, the book clubs, will they be able to start up? Do you have any, any clue on any of that yet? Um, I think some of our book clubs that are smaller in attendance, I can see maybe for the fall happening. Um, Barbara does a couple that I think there's usually less than 10 people. I can see those happening the problem is right now we're using the community room to quarantine books so we don't now we don't have a space to hold programs until we kind of reduce that quarantining materials and i like the board of health and 
also myself don't want to stop quarantining materials we'd have to figure out a different situation um maybe in the fall if the weather's still nice we can do it outside yeah because i i have always enjoyed the the lecture series when i when i get over to the library there and and there are certain certain speakers that just bring out a crowd of people right and it you know that's like we appreciate we love having the authors come and talk but having right now putting 20 30 people in the community room it's just not a possibility right and it's and it's constant like we just got notified by the state that we could open to in person yesterday and it could open yesterday to in person but it would only be they could only come to the circulation desk yeah so yeah. it's constant like the state tells us when they want us to have the information yeah, and I'm, I'm sure you'll be you'll be much happier in the library when people can actually get into the staff. Oh yeah, house. we've missed our patrons so much. We miss their faces. It's nice to at least see them when they return their books and when they pick up their books. But again, it is it is challenging not to have that face to face interaction, to have those community connections, to have the conversations with our patrons about what their kids are doing, what they're doing, and it, it is hard. Yeah. Uh, well. Uh, I, I want to thank you, Marcy, for, for uh, spending this time with me and explaining a lot of things that people probably haven't heard about what's going on in the library and what to expect when it reopens again. And I'm looking forward to the time when I can come in and actually spend some time and see you folks face to face again, too, because, you know, all the librarians in there are just wonderful people, and I, I enjoy talking with them so much. Yes. Thank you so much, Paul. Okay, well, thank you, and uh, maybe come about the time when things do open up for people to actually come in and spend time in the library, we can sit down and talk again. Yes, that would be lovely. Okay, thank you so much, Marcy. Thank you. Bye-bye.